are coming on the air with President-elect Trump escaping basically any chance of a trial in the two federal cases against him, with the special counsel moving to get the January 6th and classified documents cases wiped out. Mr. Trump's claiming it as a huge win, but there are some big legal and political questions ahead, like what does this whole thing mean for the future of the Justice Department? We've got it covered coming up in just a second. Also tonight, prosecutors in France want the maximum sentence for a man accused of organizing the mass rape of his wife, what this horrific case means for the future of the Me Too movement in that country. Then workers at one of America's busiest airports are walking off the job right at the start of what's expected to be a record-breaking travel week. We're live at another busy airport with fears about that strike spreading. And speaking of planes, our Tom Costello shows us his overnight visit with One Airlines team working around the clock to make sure your trip to see your family goes smooth and safe this holiday season. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we're starting with that breaking news here in Washington. In just the last couple of minutes, we're learning a judge is signing off on the special counsel's request to dismiss his federal investigation into President-elect Donald Trump. Yet another historic moment after four years full of them. Remember what we're talking about here, the charges against a former president, now president-elect, that he tried to subvert the legitimate results of the 2020 election, culminating in the deadly January 6th attack on the Capitol, the first time a president has ever faced charges for what he did in office. That one, it is officially done. That's on top of the other case against him, right? The dozens of charges he faced down in Florida for allegedly mishandling classified documents, including nuclear secrets. Remember the stacked boxes at Mar-a-Lago on a stage, on a floor, in the bathroom? No official ruling clearing that one for the acts, but it could come soon. These two cases are certainly not going to trial now or anytime in the near future or even the medium term future. And it's clear from Jack Smith's filing, there's only one reason this is happening. One reason, Mr. Trump's re-election. Smith writes in one of the filings, quote, the government's position on the merits of the defendant's prosecution has not changed, but the circumstances have. So now tonight, some big questions about what's next. Like, is this it? Are these cases dead dead, like gone for good? Will we get a more comprehensive report on what Jack Smith planned to say in court? That is still a possibility. And what does this whole thing mean for the future of the Justice Department writ large? As the president-elect has suggested, he may be looking for vengeance. In just the last couple of hours, he's declaring victory. You see it here in his Truth Social post saying he persevered against all odds and won. We're going to get the legal breakdown from Danny Savalos in just a second, but I want to start with Ken Delaney. And Ken, Ken, there's a lot that's interesting here, right? It is the historic moment, and it is the way that Jack Smith seems to be standing by, in the January 6th case, standing by the case he built, even as he's clearly reading the writing on the wall, that no matter what he does now, this case goes away in two months. That's right, Hallie. Now, Jack Smith had to do this because he's a Department of Justice employee, and he asked the Office of Legal Counsel, does the DOJ policy that a president can't be prosecuted, uh, does that apply to a president who, before he even takes office, after he's elected? And they came back and said yes. So he had to do this. But what's clear is that Jack Smith wanted control of the way these cases ended, and he wanted to do it uh, without prejudice, as you mentioned, because had he resigned and left these cases hanging, then the Trump Justice Department would have had control of how the cases ended, and they might have done something entirely different. They might have left a record that suggested the Justice Department wasn't standing behind these cases. But as you mentioned, uh, Jack Smith is saying very clearly in the filing that this is all about the policy. It's not about the strength of the evidence or whether he thought he could prove these cases in court, Alex. I want to read more from what the president-elect is saying today because he's calling these cases a waste of $100 million in taxpayer money. And baselessly here, saying that the prosecutors did the bidding of the Democratic Party, then he went after other state-level prosecutors. Again, he, it is not a surprise that Donald Trump is attacking Jack Smith here. He has now for months, if not longer, I mean years, really. What does happen to Jack Smith? Is he like, is he out? Yeah, Jack Smith is going to uh, first file a report to the attorney general. He's required by regulation to do that. But we don't think, uh, based on the time frame here, that this report is going to tell us much we don't already know. There's been a lot of evidence already placed in the public record. And then he's going to resign. And there's every likelihood that the, the Trump Justice Department will appoint a special counsel to investigate the investigators, as uh, the first Trump administration did with John Durham, if you recall. Uh, and a lot of people are going to have to hire lawyers and sit for interviews. But look, Donald Trump and the Republicans have been saying for years that this investigation is weaponized and politicized, but I'm not aware of any evidence that they've put forward hmm. uh, to suggest that or prove it. 
And I've been covering these investigations for two years. I've not seen any evidence of any political interference. Merrick Garland and the people around him have scrupulously stayed away from these cases. They've tried to do it the right way. Uh, and look, the fact is that millions of Americans don't believe that. And there's nothing you or I can do about it. But uh, maybe if there is an investigation and ultimately no charges are filed or some findings are come forth that it was on the up and up, maybe that will change a few minds. But right now we have not seen the evidence that supports these charges that Donald Trump is making. Ken, you talk about the, the prospect of investigating the investigators, right, and, and what had happened previously. The difference is, come 2025, that call will be coming from inside the House. If, in fact, Pam Bondi, the former Florida Attorney General, is nominated and confirmed as the Department of Justice leader, essentially, because she has talked about publicly wanting to prosecute the prosecutors, in her words. She's backed up by, for example, at least one Republican senator saying that anybody who worked on these cases inside the Justice Department should be fired. What is the sense you're getting from those inside the DOJ about what's ahead for them come January? People are very nervous, Hallie. They believe that there will be some sort of investigation. And even though they know uh, that they didn't do anything illegal, uh, the, every single thing they've ever written in connection with this case will be scrutinized. And it'll be painful and it'll cost them money. They'll have to hire lawyers, although some have insurance to cover that. So they're worried. And the other thing, Hallie, is there are a lot of career prosecutors who were detailed to the Jack Smith investigation. They would like to go back to their normal jobs, but it's a real question whether anyone who worked on this investigation can survive in a Trump Justice Department. Whether they have the legal right to fire them or not, it would be really unpleasant for any of those people to be working under Pam Bondi. Ken Delaney, and thank you very much. More to come uh, throughout the night as we learn more. Ken, thanks. Let me bring in Danny Savalos, our legal analyst now. You heard Ken say those two sort of special words without prejudice. That's how Smith's asking the courts to dismiss the case. So in theory, I guess that doesn't kill it forever. But in practice, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And those two words go to the heart of the theme that runs through both of these motions by Jack Smith to dismiss these cases or not pursue the appeal in the case of Florida. Without prejudice just means that, in theory, the case can be brought again. With prejudice means it's never going to be brought again. But realistically, in four years, there are just so many barriers, practical and legal, to actually bringing this case again that it's not likely it will ever see the light of day again. But there, as usual with Jack Smith, he says so much without actually saying it. I mean, consider his dismissal motion. It's 10 pages. It needs. It could have been one sentence. But instead, he puts in his explanation. He says, we still think this was righteous. We're still dismissing without prejudice. The symbolism there is powerful. Even though no one will ever bring it in again, we want to leave it open that in theory, as far as we're concerned, right now, today, it could be. There's also um, the, the fact that Smith says the appeal he's filing only applies to Donald Trump. It does not apply to co-defendants uh, Carlos de Oliveira and Walt Nada. People may remember Walt Nada, who was kind of this guy who was always around in Mr. Trump's inner circle there at Mar-a-Lago there. How does the case against them move forward if Donald Trump is not also being prosecuted? Is that uh, it's obviously possible, but practically, how does that work? Hallie, I am so glad you brought up that little fact because it's quietly one of the most significant no, pieces of symbolism. No, I can't symbolism. take any credit for that question. We discuss it in the newsroom and on our phone no, calls, and so I right. put it to you, our expert. And I know that team you work with, and that all of them came up with a brilliant question. It's a brilliant point because uh, it's a major piece of symbolism that is that you don't really think about at first blush. In other words, Jack Smith is saying we're going to pursue the appeal against Trump's co-defendants. But let's get real. What's going to happen to those co-defendants as soon as Trump takes office? And by the way, that is not a live prosecution. It's in appeal. The special counsel is fighting to get that indictment reinstated because the current status is that it's dismissed. So what Jack Smith is saying is so symbolic. He's saying, essentially, for the five minutes that I will still be in this chair as special counsel, we plan to pursue that appeal against these two co-defendants parentheses that will never see the light of the day either because, of course, Donald Trump is going to get rid of that case against his co-defendants. They're like his major domos. They're people who are intensely mm. loyal to Trump. If he's going to protect anyone, it's going to be his co-defendants, uh, especially Waltin Nauta. So uh, this case is going to go away, but the special counsel makes a huge statement that he would pursue the appeal to reinstate the case against the co-defendants probably knowing that the case against the co-defendants is right. practically dead and gone for all purposes. Right.
Just super quickly, Danny, what about even the bigger legal question about the legality of a special counsel in the first place? You mean this this special counsel or a future special counsel investigating a, fu a future special, special, special counsel. counsel? Yeah, that's. I mean, that always there's always a a controversy when it comes to a special counsel to investigate the special counsel. We get into the who watches the watchman uh, dilemma. So, yes, Trump may run into some barriers there, but that doesn't mean he isn't going to try to do it. Danny Savalos, uh, thank you for being our brilliant legal mind, uh, sifting through all of this because these developments come in fast and furious this afternoon. Thank you, Danny. As you talk about President-elect Trump, we're also talking about what's happening here in Washington and the potential, the potential for a fight between him and maybe some in the Senate over the people he's picking to fill out his cabinet, to fill out his administration come 2025. Remember, we've already seen some Senate Republicans essentially tank the nomination of this guy, Matt Gates. Remember, he was going to maybe be the AG like a week ago. Now he's withdrawn. No shot at that happening. All because some in the Senate, in Mr. Trump's own party, decided to flex some co-equal branch muscle. Will they do it again for some of the other controversial picks? Like, for example, Pete Hegseth, his selection to lead the Department of Defense, who's accused of sexual assault. That is an allegation he denies. RFK Jr., also accused of sexual harassment, opposed to some vaccines. Remember, he's the pick for health secretary. Then there's Tulsi Gabbard, the pick for director of national intelligence, who's been accused of ties to Russia and Syria. Again, she denies that she is a mouthpiece for Russian propaganda. Aaron Gilchrist is in West Palm Beach, Florida. What's so interesting here, this is the next step. You've got all the big cabinet picks named. You know, FBI director is still waiting on that, but like Treasury, Defense, State, those are the biggies. Those are in place, at least what Donald Trump wants to be in place. Washington's very quiet, and I hate to say the Q word, but the Senate's home, right? Republican, they're, they're, and Democrats, they're back home getting ready for Thanksgiving. And yet, when they come back, there will be questions over the whip count. Who is ready to back or buck some of these controversial choices? Give us a sense of what you're hearing and where this goes. Yeah, I think you're right. Those are the questions that are out there right now, right? We know that there are folks who are saying Donald Trump coming in as president should be able to choose the people that he wants to be on his team. And there's logic, obviously, that that is the case, right? But we know that the Senate does have this advise uh, and consent function that's always been the case as well. And so there are some on the, on the Republican side who say, you know what, we want to meet that 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 uh, expectation of folks who are in the Senate. We want to be able to hear out these nominees. But then there still is concern about the other folks who may be inclined to push back a little bit, who may not be inclined to just sort of fall in line behind Donald Trump. And what happens to those people? Uh, uh, nothing is an option, right? But we also know that, th that history tells us that Donald Trump has a long memory and that there are people who go against him, yeah. Republicans who go against him. It raises the question of whether he might sort of put his thumb on the scale in their next race uh, for, for Senate, whether he would have use his power and influence, which is considerable, uh, to favor somebody who might be a challenger to somebody who doesn't agree with him in the incoming Senate. So there's a nerd thing that I want to talk about that's important that comes back around to like an interesting thing. The nerd thing is this, this thing called a memorandum of understanding, right? This, as you know, is the formal sort of signature that officially puts the transition process in place, and that includes FBI background checks. It appears that as of right now, that has not been done. That has not been completed, and there's some consternation on the part of some Democrats specifically about why these candidates haven't been vetted by the FBI, concern around that. You've heard from some Republicans who are like, well, nobody really cares how their background checked. Um, but that plays a part into some of this confirmation discussion as well, Eric. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Logic says that if these background checks had been, had been done, perhaps some people would not have risen to the top and there, some of these controversies would not exist because those people wouldn't have been put up as nominees if, if background checks suggest that there was something uh, really questionable in their history. And now you have uh, folks like you, like you talked about a moment ago, Pete Hegseth, obviously, excuse me, sorry, uh, Matt Gates. Who, Buggy out uh, there, babe. I know. Who, I got you. <laughs> everything that flies in West Palm Beach is coming at me right now, <laughs> Alex. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, so, uh, and so you've got, you've got folks who uh, are, are, are being questioned because these background checks haven't been done. Now, the, the uh, Trump campaign and people close to it have said, you know what, there are vetting processes that are being executed on these people before they're presented as nominees, but not to the extent that the FBI would do. The FBI can access information that perhaps a typical lawyer or investigator can't access. And of course, when the confirmation hearings start, there are going to be questions that come potentially from Democrats 
that perhaps the, the Trump transition team isn't prepared for, perhaps these uh, nominees aren't prepared for when they're sitting in front of a panel yeah. who's, who's asking these, these questions that could be deeply probing. And what else might come out? We don't know. And the FBI, FBI wouldn't have warned uh, the Trump campaign ahead of time. And by the way, Donald Trump might have heard those FBI warnings and chosen to move ahead anyway. That's a hypothetical. We don't know the answer to that. But to your point, those confirmation hearings uh, could be incredibly illuminating. Aaron Gilchrist, um, we'll let you go get some off spray. I hear they sell it down there in South Florida. And we'll see you back at 6. Thank you, friend. Appreciate it. Right now, airport workers at one of the busiest spots in the U.S. are off the job during what's expected to be the busiest Thanksgiving travel season yet. We're talking about Charlotte, the international airport down there. They're on strike. They want more money. And they want what they call respect on the job during this holiday travel season. It's all happening as a record-breaking 80 million Americans are set to leave home, leave home meaning at least 50 miles away, over the next week, according to AAA. That's on the road. Nearly 2 million more than last year. The TSA is also expecting big numbers, too. And this airline striker, airport worker strike may be heading west. Look at workers at LAX. They're rallying today for better pay. Not a strike, but a rally. Forecasters are warning of a pretty cold, messy Thanksgiving, a coast-to-coast -coast storm that could be a big problem even beyond all this. We'll get to Bill Karens on that in just a second as you're seeing some of those images from that winter freeze. But I want to start with Adrian Bradas, who's at Chicago O'Hare Forest. So here's the thing. Everybody's going to Grandma's house for Thanksgiving, right? We know this is some of the busiest travel time uh, of the year. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, next week, etc. You have a lot of things that could be real messy for air travel. What are airlines doing and airports doing to try to get a handle on it? You know, they've increased staffing, but we could see delays this week. Let's start with Charlotte, where that strike is happening. The impact there, Hallie, is expected to be minimal. And a spokesperson with one of the companies who employs these workers who are on strike say they have taken steps to minimize disruptions. But we're talking about essential workers, Hallie, the folks who clean the airplanes, other folks who help passengers who may need extra assistance, for example, with a wheelchair. That strike only expected to last one day. Now, weather, which Bill is going to talk about, could impact travel for some folks this week. Also, there's a shortage of air traffic controllers across the country, which could slow operations. Starting tomorrow, Hallie, TSA is expecting to screen more than 18 million passengers through December 2nd. And that's why some travelers who spoke with me today said they wanted to leave early. Never Tuesday or Wednesday. And we fly home next Tuesday, so to, to miss the big stuff. It is much more dead than I thought it would be. I thought a lot of people would be trying to beat the traffic. And I got to tell you, O'Hare is one of the busiest airports in the country, but the average wait time at the security checkpoint line today has been between 5 and 20 minutes. Allie? That's not bad. People love to zip through. Question is going to be, what does it look like on the highways, right? Will people zip through there? Is there going to be a backup? AAA says lower gas prices are part of what's helping to get people back on the roads. For sure, those lower gas prices, a bonus indeed. The prices have been falling since the summer. Take a look at your screen. I want to show you some of the numbers. Nationally, gas cost about $3 a gallon across the country. A big difference compared to this time last year. This time last year, folks were paying about $3.26. Listen, if you're filling up your gas tank, we know you're going somewhere to fill up on fun. But if you're hitting the road tomorrow, or Wednesday, it is best to leave before 11 a.m. if you want to avoid traffic. Allie? Adrian Broadus, thank you very much. Posted up there for us in Chicago. Bill Karens, all right. Break it to us, man. <laughs> I know you don't shy away from the bad news. Uh, <laughs> gross, cold, snow, rain, yuck, watch a movie. Everything's stay home. fine as long as we leave Thanksgiving out. So we just, <laughs> everything else is good. So let's get there. All right. So we're watching the storm coming into the West Coast. This is not like the storm from last week. It's not causing that yeah. many problems, but there is a little bit of rain and snow. But this is the origins of what will ruin Thanksgiving, at least the weather wise, for a lot of people on the East Coast. So as we go throughout tonight and tomorrow, it starts to spread through the Intermountain West. We're going to get the typical snow and the high elevations, a little bit of rain in the valleys. Then the storm by Wednesday.
Wednesday makes its way into the middle of the country. It gets a little bigger, picks up a little more rain shown in the green. There's not a lot of wintry weather out of this. So yes, we could get some minor airport delays out of Chicago, St. Louis, possibly Cleveland. I mean, very minor. It's going to be light rain. They should, you know, volume will cause more problems than the light rain. Then this all heads to the East Coast. So let's go to Wednesday, Matt. This is supposed to be, everyone says, AAA, the biggest travel day of the year. It looks pretty good. Denver, uh, I-25 could be a little issues there. I-70, we're okay. East Coast looks great. West Coast looks great. Then we take this entire mess to the east. So in other words, the airports are fine on Wednesday. But by the time we get to Thursday, this storm gets a little bit stronger as it gets to the east coast. And it's going to tap into some colder air. So that means the possibility of snow, especially any of the higher elevations in areas of New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. This will be a soaking rain the first half of Thanksgiving. So, you know, it's going to be like the Thanksgiving poncho parade, unfortunately, in New York. Uh, all the way to Boston, about 45. And as far as travel goes, again, it's the first half of the day. Late in the day, a lot of this rain will pass out of the region, but anyone traveling Halley during the morning and the afternoon, uh, you know, umbrella, galoshes, it'll yeah. be a steady rain. You know, it's like we were begging for rain, what, about two weeks ago? And Guess what? Uh, yeah, we're going to get it. Can I throw you a curveball? Because I know sure. what I'll be doing on Thanksgiving Day, which is sitting watching football. Are the football games going to be affected? Uh, the football game. So uh, Dallas, no problem at all. Detroit's indoors, so that's no problem at all either. So what's a, I don't know what the evening game is, though, so we'll have to look that up. Have, I apologize. It's not the I know, I know no, when two are. I, yes. I told you. I told you, you, know, you know that I'm good for the week uh, and maybe for the season. Bill yes. Karens, thank you very yeah. much. Appreciate you. Thanks, Bill. Tonight, a really highly anticipated resentencing hearing for the Menendez brothers. Some news on that front, but the news... No news yet with the new DA in the case saying in just the last couple of minutes that he looks forward to reviewing the evidence come January. I want to show you some of the new court sketches coming into us tonight from inside the hearing room. Cameras were not allowed in court, thus the sketches. Eric and Lyle Menendez were supposed to appear virtually. This was going to be big news, right? Their first public appearance together in decades. But that didn't happen because of, well, tech problems, apparently. Their lawyer speaking outside court. Watch. By January 30th or 31st, we're hoping that by the end of that or sometime sooner that we will, in fact, get the brothers released. Remember, the brothers have been behind bars for three decades, serving a life sentence without parole for shooting and killing their parents. The brothers say they did it because their father, Jose Menendez, sexually abused them. Dana Griffin is joining us now from outside court in California. Uh, talk us through this dynamic here because people wanted to show up. There were about 16 people who were in this like lottery just to be in this hearing today to see the Menendez brothers appearing virtually. That ended up not happening. Whole thing's on ice. How did we get here? Yeah, so Hallie, I was standing in that line this morning with some of the people. They were really excited. Many have been following this case for years. We get upstairs inside the courtroom and it was kind of a... Uh, a letdown for a lot of people, many who believe the brothers should be released. Many say they feel like they've served enough time for the crimes that they committed because of the new evidence that they want to present about the sexual abuse, which did not make it in during their second trial. Many people believe that this was a gross, uh, a, a gross use of, of, of the court and that they, that they had some sort of misjustice here. But one thing we did hear today was testimony from two of the Menendez brothers' aunts. They are both elderly, both dealing with some medical issues. So that's why the judge allowed them to give testimony. They both said that they believe the brothers were molested. They believe that they've served their time and they want them home. They don't want to see them anymore inside the jail. And we just got an update or a statement from the incoming DA, Nathan Hockman. The judge, by the way, decided to push this date back to January 30th and 31st because he says he wants to, first of all, review the information himself, but also to give this new DA time to review as well. So Nathan Hockman sent a statement saying that Judge Jessick's decision to continue the hearing on the resentencing motion to January 30th to 31st will provide me with sufficient time to review the extensive prison records, transcripts of two lengthy trials, and voluminous exhibits as well as consult with prosecutors, law enforcement, defense counsel, and victims and victim family members. Many wanted to see Eric and Lyle Menendez. We did hear them, not sure which one, but they did confirm that they could see and hear us inside the courtroom. But again, we just heard that really short remark from them. Hallie. All right, so more to come in just a couple months from now. Dana Griffin, thank you very much for being in there and for being on top of that. Appreciate it. Still to come here on the show, the nightmare expense account situation that's grinding Macy's corporate earnings report to a halt just ahead of the holiday season. What do you hear this? 
Plus, Dictionary.com's very mindful word of the year. Who President Biden is pardoning today, or what, rather, in our five things. But first, I'm telling you, you are not going to believe why Macy's is delaying this really important earnings report that was supposed to come out tomorrow. Turns out it's because one employee apparently didn't do their expenses properly to the tune of, wait for it, $154 million. <laughs> Woo. So now this multinational corporation can't even put out this whole third quarter report yet, which is the one investors were supposed to use to get clues into how much Macy's thinks shoppers will spend over the holiday season. That's after this one employee, apparently intentionally, in the company's words, left out millions of dollars worth of deliveries over a period of years. Again, $154 million. Macy's is obviously investigating. Sam Brock is joining us now. The company hasn't said whether they're going to charge this employee. This is a staggering amount of money we're talking about here. How does something like this even happen? Because it's not like the employee, Macy says, they didn't pocket it and run off with it. No, certainly, Hallie. You're talking about a big chunk of money. What's maybe more astounding than that is over three plus years, right? This started back in Q4 of 2021 and stretched all the way to Q3 of 2024. How did no one at the company notice that this was going on? We're Sam, talking about expenses for like delivery, right? Like an $8 right? sunscreen on your expense report. Sure, All right. of our bosses, which is fine. It's, the, it's their money. They can know about the $8, if, but like it's it, just... it's. A <laughs> If we messed up our expense reports like this, I think we would have lost our jobs a long time ago. Be that as wow. it may, here's kind of a shocking part about this, Hallie. If you look at the pre-market trading for Macy's, stock was down like 8%. By the end of the day, it was trading at $15.94 a share down, two and a quarter percent, which is to say investors looked at this truncated earnings report and were like, eh, nothing really to see here, which, which may sound a little bit surprising. We mentioned the sum, $152 million, $54 million, something like that. It is and it isn't a lot of money. It isn't in the sense that the overall uh, expenses in this area for Macy's were $4.46 billion, and you're talking about $152 million, so it's a fraction. But the, another way to look at this is their, their net income for all of 2023 was a little over $100 million. So this is 50% more than that, right? So depending on how you want to slice it, it is a lot of money. The company did have a statement here, Allie. I'll read you just a portion of that. While we work dil diligently to complete the investigation as soon as practicable, whatever that means, and ensure this matter is handled appropriately, our colleagues across the company are focused on serving our customers and executing our strategy for a successful holiday season. The bottom line here is that Macy says it didn't affect their cash flow, didn't affect their vendor payments. They're moving forward and expecting a full earnings report on December 11th. Okay, and that earnings report is going to be interesting because for a lot of these big companies, right, they're forecasting to a degree what they expect for the all-important holiday season, yeah. right? It's a very pivotal time of year. Um, there is no question. There's going to be a lot of eyeballs on them. In terms of the information that we have already received from Macy's, they did show that they're down about 2.4% year over year for Q3 when it turn, when it concerns the sales here. So that's not a great sign. Investors are planning on spending more money, but Macy's does feel very good about 50 or so locations where sales have actually gone up. So we're always seeing the silver lining here, Hallie. Sam Brock, thank you very much. You got it. Uh, appreciate that. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a judge in Tennessee ruling there will be separate trials for the former police officers accused of killing Tyree Nichols. Remember, Nichols was beaten during a traffic stop in 2023 and died three days later. Attorneys for three of the now former officers argued their trials should be separated from a fourth who pleaded guilty. The three former officers have all pleaded not guilty to all charges. The trial is set to begin in April. Number two, Hyundai is recalling more than 40,000 cars because they might roll away. They can shift out of park even if you don't press down the brake pedal, essentially. This is a recall covering 2025 Santa Cruz and two, uh, Tucson models. Hyundai says it hasn't gotten any reports of crashes so far and that dealerships will fix the issue for free. Number three, President Biden making some pardons today. Turkey pardons, the White House annual tradition. Peach and Blossom, they're both about four months old. They are set to live out their lives as agricultural ambassadors, retiring at a farm in Minnesota. Number four, dictionary.com is out with this year's word of the year. They say it is demure. The word demure. Pretty mindful choice. 
one that you've probably seen if you're on TikTok or on the internet in any way at any time. Dictionary.com says there are 200 times as many searches for demure this year than in previous years. Number five, Patrick Mahomes getting fined more than $14,000 for what the NFL calls a violent gesture during last week's game against the Buffalo Bills. The Kansas City Chiefs QB allegedly put his hands up like he, as if he were holding a rifle. A rep for Mahomes did not immediately respond to a request for comment. When we come back, what Indiana officials are saying created this hole we're about to show you in the roof. Look at that, in the roof of the convention center. Plus, new anger after devastating flooding in Britain and Ireland, disrupting travel and knocking out power. What cleanup looks like for people there and why they're so frustrated with officials. In a case that has shocked France and the rest of the world, a French prosecutor today is asking for the max sentence for the man who organized the mass rape of his wife for about a decade. Remember, Dominique Pellicot admitted to drugging his wife, Giselle, repeatedly and inviting dozens of strangers to sexually assault her while she was unconscious. The prosecution telling the court the maximum sentence is 20 years, which is a lot, but at the same time too little in view of the seriousness of the acts that were committed and repeated. You are hearing and seeing some of the crowds of supporters who have regularly shown up to support Giselle Pellico throughout this trial. She's become a symbol in that country of the fight against sexual violence. Pellico insisted the trial be held in public. She wanted it public, saying she hoped it would help other women speak up. Yasmin Vesugian is joining us now. And Yasmin, it is not just, it is 50 other men who are also yeah. on trial accused of rape. So walk us through the scope of this, uh, the sentencing and where this goes. Um, it's incredible to think what has taken place um, with this couple, um, this now ex-wife and ex-husband, um, and what has kind of emerged throughout this prolonged trial. And in fact, Dominique Pellicot has admitted to, to drugging his wife um, and to inviting strangers into their home who subsequently sexually assaulted and, and raped um, his then wife while she was unconscious. It is, it is horrendous to even think about the reality of that. And it's really kind of gripped the nation, gripped France throughout this entire time. I mean, the evidence how that was shown throughout this case was 20,000 or so videos um, that were saved on hard drives on Dominique Pellico's phone as well that were played in the courtroom in front of Giselle Pellico as they presented the case um, in this courtroom. And remember, these are incidences in which she has no memory of. She was unconscious and she was drugged um, this entire time. Just to kind of give you a sense of how this is really affecting the country as a whole, she was applauded as she arrived at the courthouse just the mm. other day. She is becoming a symbol for women everywhere, and specifically in France, going up against her ex-husband, Hal, along with these 50 or so men accused of sexually assaulting and, and raping her in her home. And the fact that this has become so, so high profile, Yaz, yeah. as you mentioned, the fact that she has become this kind of symbol, is that expected to have any impact on the sentencing here? Yes. I, I, the, I, 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 my assumption would be maybe not if it's just the letter of the law, but you tell me. So the prosecutor has essentially said we are asking for the maximum here, which is, which is 20 years. However, the prosecutor has gone on to say as well, that is not enough. And she mm -hmm. said, and I quote, he is considered incredibly dangerous, a husband and a grandfather responsible for the most horrendous acts. He is not mentally incompetent. He chose to do this. So in a way, it could impact the sentencing in that he receives the maximum and or yeah. beyond here. And then, of course, we're talking about those 50 or so men who could see anywhere from 10 to possibly 20 years in prison as well. And you see in some of these images here, Hal, of the renderings in the courtroom, many of those men decide to show up in masks um, because to hide their identities from uh, the courtroom cameras. Wow. Yasmin Vesugian, thank you for staying on top of this story. Uh, Thanks, one that I know you've been following for a while. Appreciate it. Tonight, also overseas, you've got more rain drenching the UK as a deadly storm batters Britain with a ton of flooding, some landslides, and a whole lot of power outages. 
At least five people have been killed. And the cleanup it has barely begun. You've got trees down all over the place in England, Wales, Ireland. Look at this. You see the water up to almost the brake lights, a little bit past that of that van right there. Some people have been seen using buckets to try to get the water out of their houses. And there is a growing anger now. Some folks are furious with local officials, saying they were nowhere near prepared for something like this and didn't give them any warning. Matt Bradley is joining us now from London. If not any warning, Matt, at least not enough warning, right? That's where some of this fury stems from. That's the real issue, and the Met Office had said that they did offer warning 48 hours in advance, so they're kind of rebuffing a lot of these criticism. But, you know, Storm Bert has been causing a lot of damage, at least three deaths in England and Wales. Some of the winds were clocked at more than 80 miles an hour. Hundreds of homes have been flooded and roads were washed out. And the problem is, as you said, there were some forecasters who have been taking blame for this, for not predicting the size of the storm adequately. And in one of the hard-hit areas of Wales, that's a country in the western part of the UK, the Met Office, the Met Office, they're the ones who do the weather here, they said it was only a yellow-level storm rather than a red-level storm. So that's been causing a lot of anger. As I said, the Met Office pushing back. But, you know, it's a lot of the patterns that we've been seeing in the past where, you know, we've been seeing weather causing its own kind of storms in politics. And now the ruling party, the Labour Party, has they, they've wasted no time blaming the previous Conservative Party. They said that the flood defenses, and this is from the Environment Minister who said this just today, that they were in the worst condition on record mm. when the Labour Party took over after those elections in July. So this is becoming very much like we've seen so many times in the States and in Spain a couple of weeks ago. It's becoming a political issue. That's right. Hallie. Setting aside even the politics, Matt, just looking at some of the pretty incredible images we're seeing of people trying to get through the water here. This cleanup is massive. We're not talking days. It's going to be weeks or months. Fair? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, Hallie, a lot of these storms that we see here in the U.K., the weather is just generally so much milder. We're talking about 82 mile per hour winds. That was the highest what we saw with uh, Hurricane Helen uh, back a couple of months ago. That was almost twice as much, but still a ton of damage because there isn't a lot of preparation for some really, really harsh weather. But even today, we've been hearing that there is going to be more rain. The Met Office had said that Bert is going to start to pull away from the British Isles today. But even at the start today, and it's pretty late here now, there were 125 flood warnings and one severe flood warning across the country. So there could be even more rain and even more destruction. Yeah. Matt Bradley, thank you very much for that. Live for us overseas. Appreciate it. Coming up back here at home, an inside look behind the scenes at preps for holiday season travel, including what happens to those planes overnight. Our Tom Costello pulls back the curtain as one of the country's biggest airlines gets ready for what's ahead. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Midwest Bureau, the former sheriff accused of shooting and killing a county judge in Kentucky is pleading not guilty today to the charge of murder of a public official. He's already pleaded guilty to a separate murder charge and has been in jail in that state. Still not clear about what specifically the motive may have been. Also out of our Midwest Bureau, take a look at this. A car driving off the parking garage of a casino in Indiana earlier today. Police say the car went through the roof oof, of the seventh floor of the garage and into the conference room. The driver was taken to the hospital. Unclear that person's status, but nobody else was hurt. Out of our Western Bureau, San Diego police have seized thousands of pounds of magic mushroom candy bars. Under the polka dot brand, the sheriff says they were sold as safe to people when in reality they were laced with dangerous levels of THC and some other drugs. Officials say this specific brand of chocolate bar has a history of being altered. Polka dot has not returned NBC's request for comment. The holiday shopping season officially kicking off this week and it looks like a lot of folks are going to be turning online for help. Turning to TikTok, which, hey, is it the new QVC? Some people think maybe it is. A survey from Sprout Social found something like nearly 90% of customers saying social media platforms like TikTok and Insta will influence their gifting decisions. And about a quarter of Americans say they actually do plan to make purchases on those apps, and that's where the apps can make some money. Julia Borston is joining us now. I would be lying to you if I told you my phone was not filled with screen grabs from the various platforms of things that I've seen people selling. I am easily influenced in the shopping realm, I'll admit it. Um, and that, that could be a big game changer this holiday season, right? 
That's right. TikTok says it expects to see a record amount of sales on the platform this holiday season. And it's not just people who see an ad and then click to buy something from the ad or a brand that they follow clicking to take advantage of a Black Friday sale. What we are seeing is a surge of live shopping influencers who are demoing products or unwrapping things or showcasing and trying things on. And what they're doing is they're doing this live and TikTok has enabled them to have links where you can click and buy. And while they're doing a live shopping, shopping demo and never leave TikTok. So this is a win for TikTok. Oh, wait, Julia. Because it means you're shopping Julia. within the app and you're never leaving. That are that existed on regular TV and it was literally called like the Home Shopping Network or QVC, right? That's like right. that is that's a thing that happened that like Gen Z is kind of rediscovering and doing it their own way. What's old is new again. People like to see live. It's exciting. That's what we're doing right now. This is live. And I think the key thing about live shopping is it feels more authentic. People like influencers because they're impressed by them. They can relate to them. Maybe they trust them more than a 30 second spot on TV. And there's something about the authenticity of a live demonstration that makes people feel connected and excited to make a purchase. Is it to the scale yet where it's going to have any impact on the more traditional stores and online shopping, like not on social media? Well, we'll see. This is going to be an interesting thing to watch this holiday season. Younger, younger people, younger shoppers, they're the ones who are more likely, Gen Z, they're the ones who are more likely to make purchases on these social platforms. Maybe other people of that 89% see something on social media and then they go and find it at the mall. So there's a huge influence from these influencers, even if they're not closing the sale on these platforms. Um, but we'll see if it ends up having an impact. We've definitely seen some smaller brands really benefit from that attention from influencers. So interesting. Julia Borston, thank you very much. Thanks for being on. Good to see you. So airlines are working overtime right now, getting ready for what's expected to be the busiest Thanksgiving travel season on record. And our Tom Costello is getting a behind the scenes look at how one of the country's busiest airlines is gearing up for the rush with workers looking to keep you safe and comfortable. 7.45 p.m., American tail number N954AN pulls into JFK from Chicago. As the last passengers step off, the pilots are handing over control. Anything that we might have noticed that wasn't perfect on the way over, we report it. Minutes later, the 737 is empty and on the move, taxiing across the runways and pulling into Americans' 24-7 maintenance hangar where the overnight pit crew already has their orders. We'll be servicing the oil, the engine oil system. We'll be looking at the igniter plugs. They've got a long to-do list. American 737s get a workout. Ten flights each every day, carrying 1,800 passengers a day. Every 90 days, 737s must go through an overnight A-check. And routine maintenance, even at the gate, happens every night. We got a lot of work to do, and we fly at dawn. Evie Garces is in charge of all line maintenance. Is this like an indie pit crew for American Airlines? Definitely. I can tell you that our mechanics here are dedicated to do this work. They have about eight hours of touch time to complete the work. A nose to tail physical. From inspecting the flight controls to the flight deck to the passenger experience. Check the, uh, the call lights, check the reading lights. Make sure the uh, gas prevents are all good. They're not broken. There's the cracked window shade, a broken tray table, an entertainment power unit that needs replacing, a seat track that needs tightening, and the lavatory water that needs sanitizing. What's the most common complaint you hear from passengers about they want this fixed? They wish this didn't break. Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. <laughs> In today's world, Wi-Fi. Fixing the Wi-Fi is a top priority. So is checking all 328 USB and electrical plugs. Yeah, we'd like to have the, the best appearance possible. The clock is ticking. Hi there. Welcome. With 8 million passengers flying on American Airlines alone this Thanksgiving, the maintenance teams have been working ahead. We're prepaying maintenance, doing tasks to make sure that we minimize the risk during the holiday period. At 4 a.m. after a deep clean, they're done. N 954AN pushes out of the hangar and back to the terminal for catering. Flight 2485 to Miami. At 7.20 a.m., flight 2485 is boarding for Miami. Tom Costello, NBC News. Much more to come here on the show.
are coming on the air with President-elect Trump escaping basically any chance of a trial in the two federal cases against him, with the special counsel moving to get the January 6th and classified documents cases wiped out. Mr. Trump taking it as a massive win, but there are some big legal and political questions ahead. Like, what does this all mean for the future of the DOJ? We've got to look at all of it coming up in just a second. Also tonight, the loyalty test brewing between the president-elect and Republican senators yet again. Will they be as tough on some of his other picks as they were on Matt Gaetz? We'll take you live outside Trump HQ. Plus, a new delay in the Menendez brothers' fight for justice. Could the new Los Angeles DA put the whole case in jeopardy? Then, workers at one of the country's busiest airports are walking out the job, some of them, at the start of a record-breaking travel week. We're live at another busy airport as fears of a strike spread. And Macy's facing a nightmare on 34th Street ahead of the holiday season, whether holding back a key report investors want to see and what it has to do with the maybe biggest expense report mess up you've ever heard about. That's later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we're starting with that breaking news in Washington and beyond. In just the last hour, we're learning a judge is signing off on the special counsel's request to dismiss his federal investigations into President-elect Donald Trump. Let's be clear about what this is. It is yet another historic moment after four years, eight years, full of them. Remember what we're talking about here. These are charges against a former president, now set to be president again, that he tried to subvert the legitimate results of the 2020 election, a move that culminated in the deadly January 6th attack on the Capitol, the first time a president has ever faced charges for what he did while in office. That case, that case is officially done. It's gone. There's another case, right? The dozens of charges that Mr. Trump faced down in Florida for allegedly mishandling classified documents. Remember the stacked boxes at Mar-a-Lago on the stage, on the floor, in the bathroom? No official ruling yet that gives that one the clear for the ax, but that could come soon. That could go away soon. But these two cases certainly not going to trial now or in the near future or in the medium term future. And it's clear from Jack Smith's filing there is only one reason this is happening. Donald Trump's re-election. He writes in one of the filings, you see it here, that the government's position on the merits of the prosecution hasn't changed, but the circumstances have. So, some big questions tonight. Like, is this it? Are these cases dead dead, like gone for good? Will we get a more comprehensive report on what Jack Smith planned to say in court? That's a possibility. And what does all of this mean for the future of the Justice Department writ large, as the president-elect has suggested he wants vengeance? In just the last couple of hours, he's declaring victory here. You see it on his Truth Social post, saying he persevered against all odds and won. We're going to get the legal breakdown from Danny Savalos in just a second. But I want to start with Ken Delaney in here, because, Ken, there, there is a question about this potential report that Jack Smith could file in either of these cases before he leaves, right? It wouldn't do anything from a legal perspective. Donald Trump will not face uh, further prosecution here based on what's happening, at least in the January 6th trial. But that could still matter. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. Look, he's required by the regulations to file a report about his prosecution decisions to the attorney general. And this attorney general, Merrick Garland, ha has a policy of making those reports public. So we will see some kind of report. The question is, how detailed will it be, given the compressed time frame? Will it have any new information? Because generally, new information in a sensitive case like this has to be reviewed by the intelligence agencies, and that can take weeks. And so I'm led to believe that there aren't going to be a lot of new revelations here. There's already been a ton of evidence in these cases that have been made public. But what we might see is a spirited defense of the decision to bring these cases and a denial, a dispute of these really baseless charges that have been made over the years that this was somehow politicized, weaponized, or that you know this was done for political reasons to defeat Donald Trump. I've seen no evidence of that in two years of covering these cases, Allie. We know that the new attorney general pick now from Mr. Trump, Pam Bondi, the former attorney general of Florida, has said she wanted to investigate the investigators, to your point here, to prosecute the prosecutors. And let me play an exchange from Senator Eric Schmidt where he talked about what he wants to see at the DOJ. Watch. Are you suggesting you want to see special counsel Jack Smith, Attorney General Merrick Garland prosecuted? Is that what you are implying? Well, no, I think accountability means first and foremost, the people involved in this should be fired immediately. Um, and anybody part of this, uh, um, this effort to keep President Trump off the ballot and to throw him in jail for the rest of his life because they didn't like his politics and to continue to cast him as a quote-unquote threat to democracy was wrong. 
So when career officials of the DOJ hear something like that, What's going through their minds, given that these cases now uh, are essentially moot moving forward against Mr. Trump? That was some interesting rhetorical gymnastics from the attorney general there, who is a lawyer. So he knows full well that a prosecution of these people is extremely unlikely because there's no evidence they did anything illegal. But then in the next breath, he said that they tried to put Donald Trump in jail because they didn't like his politics, which, by the way, would be a crime. So, look, look, people at the DOJ mm. are, are concerned to an extent because they believe there will be some sort of investigation, as there was in the first Trump term. Uh, Special counsel John Durham, you recall, conducted a sprawling, yeah. years-long investigation, interviewed lots of people. They had to hire lawyers. We expect, they expect a replay of that here. But they also, look, there's just no evidence of any crimes committed here. Uh, at the same time, we don't know what's gone on behind the scenes. This investigator or the current justice, the, the Trump Justice Department will have access to every memo, every email uh, that Jack Smith and his team ever sent. And if any of them slipped up and said something uh, political or unwise, that will be made public. Uh, but look, the inspector general of the Justice Department reviewed the first investigation that Donald Trump said was the witch hunt, the Russia investigation. And he found that the FBI, for the most part, acted properly and without malice and political bias in that investigation. So maybe we'll see a review of this one, Howard. Ken Delanian, uh, lots to watch. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Let me bring in Danny Savalos now. So, Danny, you heard Ken uh, stick a fork in it. These cases are done. Is that the bottom line? It is. It's uh, not a legal term, but that's exactly what it, it is with these cases. In theory, the words without prejudice means the cases could be brought in the future, but they won't. These cases will no longer exist, and especially the case in Florida was already dismissed, and all they're doing is choosing not to pursue the appeal. These cases are done, uh, even though the without so four prejudice... four years from now, they're not yeah. coming back. When Donald not... Trump's out of office in 2028, 2029, right. this they're... isn't resurrected. They're not resurrected. They're not coming back. I believe the words without prejudice were used by the special counsel to send a message, a symbolic message that uh, we'll dismiss, but we won't even give you the satisfaction of saying it's mm. with prejudice, because in our view, this case had value. And even now, we're, we're dismissing with the possibility of rebringing the case, even though practically it isn't going to happen. That is more a statement than a legal reality. Do you expect President-elect Trump or his team to try to make their own statement and try to get the case thrown out with prejudice? Uh, they have a couple different options. An attorney general can come in. You know, it's interesting. Procedurally, I'm not entirely sure they can resurrect a case just for the purpose of dismissing it with prejudice. But uh, either way, to the extent the incoming attorney general can get rid of these cases permanently, the incoming attorney general is going to do that. And, of course, barring that as a last option, Donald Trump could try a self-pardon. I don't think it's even necessary. That's the thing. You've got the, the president-elect here framing this as a massive win for him. Uh, he, the reason, and Jack Smith laid it out in so many words, the reason why this is happening now, why these cases are going away, is because Donald Trump won the election in November. An example, Danny, of elections having consequences, no? Exactly right. And, you know, initially I was surprised that the special counsel even decided to consider dismissing the cases. On the one hand, they could have just blindly gone forward and sort of carried out their mission up until the very last day and acted as if nothing had happened. That might have been consistent with their whole uh, no person is above the law. But mm. notice in their filings today, that is what they are sort of saying. They're saying in 11 pages that were really unnecessary that we believe in this case. This is a good case. This is a righteous prosecution. We're not even going to give uh, the president the satisfaction of a dismissal with prejudice. The default is without prejudice. We're going to treat this like any other case. We think it was valid. So dismissal, but without prejudice. It's sort of this fantastic idea that the case could be resurrected when we always know uh, that in all likelihood it won't. Danny Savalos. Well, let me just say this before I let you go. And this is a hypothetical, and so I, I don't want you to... You Love know, them. I, I know you do. If there were to be something that happened while Donald Trump is in office, and if there were to be any kind of a prosecution, let's say in 2029 after he's out of office, that he broke the law. Again, very hypothetical. This is pure speculation. What's happening today doesn't preclude something else new and fresh in four years. Two answers to that. Number one, look at the New York State case. Those prosecutors, their best possible scenario is to prolong sentencing until 2029. Whether or not that can even happen uh, is a question that still needs to be answered constitutionally. But then 
now, since the first Trump presidency and now, we've had the Supreme Court's immunity decision. That's right. So it's going to be a lot harder to prosecute Trump for something that he did while he was president. And even now, his attorneys are arguing that under the Presidential Transition Act, he's technically already the president because he's making presidential decisions. Hmm. So I think the immunity decision narrows that window for a prosecutor, state or federal, after he leaves office in 2029 to say, hey, what you did in office was corrupt and bad, and maybe he sells pardons for bags of cash, under the Supreme Court's immunity decision, that might not be prosecutable. Danny Savalos, uh, thank you for being with us, for sifting through all of this, uh, as always, tonight and every night. Appreciate it. As we talk about Mr. Trump, let's talk about what could happen come January and the potential, the potential for a confirmation fight for the people who he wants to be around him, the people who he wants in his cabinet, in his administration come 2025. And listen, we've already seen some Senate Republicans flex some co-equal branch muscle by basically tanking the nomination of the guy you just saw there, Matt Gates, who was Mr. Trump's first pick to run the Justice Department. Question's going to be, what happens now for some of these other controversial loyalists that Mr. Trump has selected to be in his administration? Somebody like the man you see here, Pete Hegseth, the former Fox News host who has been selected to lead the Pentagon. He faces an accusation of sex assault, which he denies. What about Robert F. Kennedy Jr., also accused of sexual harassment? He's opposed to some vaccines. Remember, he's the pick for health secretary. And Tulsi Gabbard, the pick for director of national intelligence. Democrats say she's got ties to Russia, to Syria, that she parrots propaganda. She denies the allegations, RFK as well, uh, previously. Aaron Gilchrist is in West Palm Beach, Florida. The point is, Aaron, these are sort of shorthanded as quote-unquote controversial picks for some of the reasons that we've laid out here. The question is going to be, are they controversial enough for Senate Republicans to do what they did to Matt Gates and send the alarm quietly behind the scenes in many instances privately that it's not going to get done or not? Yeah, you're right. That is the big question. And I think that's it's a question that uh, it seems as though is going to be asked quietly before we actually see uh, some of these people get to the confirmation process that will start after the new year. Uh, Matt Gates, for some people, for some Republicans, uh, was was clearly somebody that they needed to question right out of the gate. These other people who've had their backgrounds sort of picked apart in the in the media uh, are, are folks that seem to be at least okay in the process for now. We know that Pete Hegseth spent some time on the Hill last week answering questions, meeting with senators there. We also know that Tulsi Gabbard is supposed to go to the Hill uh, next week after Thanksgiving to have similar meetings. And so we'll see where they come out of uh, that process. I think right now we have Republicans that you can sort of put in two buckets, right? There are some who say Donald Trump uh, won the election and has a mandate. He should be able to put into place the people that he believes are best to help him govern hard stop. And then you have other people who say, uh, senators who say, you know what? We have a responsibility to provide advice and, and cons consent uh, as is in, written into the Constitution, and they want to do that. They want to hear these people out. They want to be able to ask questions and be able to provide uh, that advice. At the end of the day, though, Hallie, uh, I, I think you, we're going to see uh, Republicans say that, you know what, we won the Senate, we won the House, right. we won the White House, and we're going to govern in, in the way that uh, Donald Trump lays out for us to govern. Uh, and, and some of these people, it'll be interesting to see how the confirmation process uh, impacts them ultimately. You know, Aaron, I said it to Danny in a different context, and I'll say it again here. Elections have consequences, right? Donald Trump does have a grip on the Republican Party. We talk about that a lot. It is a very firm grip, as the sort of withdrawal of the nomination of Matt Gates showed. It is not um, a 100 percent grip, right? Like, there are clearly, like, a couple of cracks. The question is, what is big enough for those cracks to appear here? It doesn't look like some of these other candidates, like the pick for Treasury Secretary, Scott, Benson, Scott Besant, rather, um, is likely to have many issues in the Senate confirmation process. We'll see. He is somebody who is arguably uh, more in the Republican mainstream when it comes to financial matters. But he's going to be the person who carries out, just like all of these other cabinet picks, Donald Trump's agenda here. And for Besant, that's going to mean more tax cuts. That's going to mean tariffs as well, right? Yeah, you're right. And, and Scott Besant, you know, we looked at Wall Street today. Wall Street seems to be happy about the choice of Scott Besant uh, for Treasury Secretary. Elon Musk had indicated that he felt like Scott Besant was a business-as-usual pick for Donald Trump before he was chosen by Donald Trump, and, and, and there was that criticism. But Wall Street says, you know what? He is uh, a known commodity, and, and, and Wall Street likes 
to know what's happening before it happens, as it's happening, as opposed to having sort of uh, uncertainty. And so Scott Besson comes in as a hedge fund manager for many, many years, as someone that Wall Street is familiar with, someone he's comfortable with, someone who has suggested uh, uh, a steady hand or at least a, a moderating hand in some of the things that he would want to do. You're right, he's going to want to carry out Donald Trump's plans. Tax cuts are very likely. The idea of tariffs, though, uh, I think he, he, he's in line with Donald Trump's thinking on that ultimately, big picture wise, but this is a person who's indicated that the use of tariffs would be something that would be more akin to uh, using a screwdriver as opposed to a hammer, not something that would just be bam, 100% hmm. uh, on China, 100% on Mexico, like we heard uh, Donald Trump say on the campaign trail. Instead, this would be a tool he suggested uh, that he would use. Uh, and as someone who advised Donald Trump during the campaign on economic issues, uh, this is somebody that uh, clearly the president-elect uh, trusts and, and wants to have help him get through tax cuts, get through potentially the use of tariffs, uh, and, to, and to straighten up, from the Republicans' perspective, the economy. Aaron Gilchrist, live for us down there in West Palm Beach. Aaron, thank you very much. Appreciate that. So it is the Monday before Thanksgiving, which means that right now maybe you're packing up to get ready for your trip. Maybe you're cleaning your house to get ready for visitors coming to you for the holidays. And you know what airport workers are doing? They are bracing for what is expected to be the busiest Thanksgiving travel season ever. Workers at Charlotte Douglas down there, look at them, they're on strike. They want more money. They want more respect on the job at this time. With so many Americans expected to take to the skies, the strike may be spreading west because at workers at LAX, they're rallying for better pay. People are also expected to hit the road with AAA, saying that a record-breaking 80 million Americans are set to go somewhere with forecasters warning of a cold and soggy Thanksgiving that could really mess with things. Don't be mad at me. I'm just the messenger. Bill Karens is, too. You can be mad at him. We'll get to him in a second. But I want to start with Adrian Bradas, who's live for us at Chicago O'Hare. So, Adrian, talk to us about travel right now, because things are ramping up. We know that the airports are just going to get busier over the course of the next 48 hours. Yeah, it is. And travelers who spoke with us today, Hallie, said they want to save time and money. And one woman says her mission was accomplished. She purchased her flight a few months ago because today offered the lowest airfare. And that's what several other travelers told us. And they want to get out ahead of this big travel rush because starting tomorrow through December 2nd, TSA expects to screen more than 18 million passengers. Here's what one woman had to say. I thought Thanksgiving was last week, so I booked the wrong week. <laughs> but so now my kid gets to come home for Thanksgiving, too. Getting through it quickly? Well, no, you can't, you can't defeat that, you know what I mean, as far as just having patience to get through, through the airport. So they did show up with patience today, but the wait times at the security checkpoint lines here at Chicago O'Hare International Airport haven't been that bad. The longest wait, about 20 minutes today. Hallie? Adrian Bradas, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. So, Bill, the question is going to be, what about this weather, this storm that is moving basically west to east? Because I know Thanksgiving Day is going to be a mess, but then it's going to get super cold for the trip back home, right? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, Thursday is the only day people may not be able to get to their destinations in some spots. Isolated, not widespread. Everyone else until then should be able to get there, maybe some delays. And then on the way back, you know, we can deal with the cold, but you just kind of have to be prepared for it. So this first storm is going to bring some early rain tomorrow morning to I-95. Minor delays at the airport, so probably none on the roads. And then that storm's gone. Then all of our focus will be on the storm coming into the West Coast. This storm isn't like the last two. It's not a huge monster storm. It's just kind of a fast-moving storm that's going to have some snow and rain depending on your elevations uh, through the west. So as we go through tomorrow, especially anyone traveling here, the Intermountain West, especially Utah and areas of Colorado, it is going to get a little dicey and the roads are going to be difficult. By the time we get to Wednesday, this storm flies into the Ohio Valley. This is at 8 p.m., by the way. Most of the daylight hours dry on Wednesday. Wednesday evening is when we start to see rain breaking out here, northern half of Alabama, Mississippi, back in the Kentucky, Tennessee, through the Ohio Valley. L maybe some snowflakes mixed in, but no icy travels expected. The cold air is behind this storm, and it's going to be really cold, like you know, almost like midwinter type cold behind this storm. So here's how it looks on Wednesday. Notice Bismarck's only 23 degrees. That's the high temperature, and that's about as warm as Bismarck is going to get for a bunch of days in a row. Notice the East Coast is just fine on Wednesday. No problems in the West. If we have any airport problems whatsoever, we'll keep an eye on Denver with the rain and snow mix. I think Chicago late in the day in Detroit, same with St. Louis, a little bit of light rain. 
shouldn't have major delays at the airports because of that. Maybe volume combined with that. East Coast airports look just fine. And as Hallie, you were mentioning, by the time we get to Thursday, that's when we see this hitting to the East Coast. This looks like when we'll see the big impact on the roads and in the air. If you have flights in and out of any of the big city air, D.C., all the way to Boston, New York, Philly, Baltimore included, especially early in the day, that's when you're the best chance for some very heavy rain and delays. Also, maybe some gusty winds. North will get a little bit. Notice the rest of the country is looking good. I mean, listen, we'll take it. We'll take those sun, you know, symbols when we can get them. Bill, um, yeah. we talked about the Thanksgiving night game. It's going to be Dolphins at Packers. How's Green Bay looking on Thanksgiving Day? Pretty gross. Uh, it is looking uh, cold. Uh, you know, okay. not like not like football playoffs cold, but it looks like wind chills will be like five to ten degrees, and the temperature will be twenty. So when oh. you're watching the game, you know, you'll see everyone's breath, and you know, you'll probably see a couple people in the crowd painted with no shirts on, of course, at the yeah, end of Green sure. Bay with the cheese head sure. on top. But uh, other under a blanket, <laughs> watching from the couch. So. That's right. The yeah. blanket too. So the only other thing we have to worry about is that snow, possibly Hallie, on Thursday. And yeah. so here's a little look. So we, we like to compare our computer models. We get different guidance because this is. Are kind we going to talk dis- about American and European? Yes, we are. So oh, first man. one is the American. You know, you know me. You know, know. it. I'm ready. Let's so do it. So this is the Buckle American. Up. Notice the colors. White is light, moderate's blue, purple's heavy. It's too early to give exact amounts. They're Fine. pretty much, you know, it's light or moderate. So now let's talk about the European model. And all of a sudden you notice we're painting a lot more blue and a lot more purple, especially in all the mountainous areas, to moderate to heavy. So our European model has this almost like a nor'easter type storm for areas of central and northern New England. So that's why I said, Hallie, some people may not be able to get to where they want to get to Thursday afternoon, evening the northern half of the northeast. So just keep that in mind, especially New England, and also a lot of heavy lake effects, no Cleveland, the Buffalo. So we'll fine-tune that tomorrow, but just anyone traveling in that area, I know you know how to drive in the snow, but it doesn't mean you want to on Thanksgiving Day. <laughs> That's a very good point. Bill Karens, thank you very much. Consider yourself booked and busy for the next couple of nights here on the show. Appreciate you. Tonight, a super-anticipated resentencing hearing for the Menendez brothers is now on ice. That's right. It's being pushed back until next year, till January, with the new DA on the case saying in just the last hour that he looks forward to reviewing the evidence. These are some of the new court sketches coming into us tonight from inside the hearing room of the brothers, lawyer and family members in court. You see it? Cameras were not allowed there. Now, here's the, here's the thing, right? This is why this was a big deal, because Eric and Lyle Menendez, you see them there. That was 30 years ago, right? They were supposed to now appear today virtually together. So the first time appearing in court together, even virtually for the first time in literally decades, that did not happen because of technical problems. Here's their lawyer outside court. By January 30th or 31st, we're hoping that by the end of that or sometime sooner that we will, in fact, get the brothers released. Remember, these brothers have been behind bars for three decades, serving a life sentence without parole for shooting their parents to death. The brothers say they did it because their father, Jose Menendez, sexually abused them. Dana Griffin is joining us now from outside court in California. Talk us through this dynamic here because people wanted to show up. There were about 16 people who were in this like lottery just to be in this hearing today to see the Menendez brothers appearing virtually. That ended up not happening. Whole thing's on ice. How did we get here? Yeah, so Hallie, I was standing in that line this morning with some of the people. They were really excited. Many have been following this case for years. We get upstairs inside the courtroom, and it was kind of a a letdown for a lot of people. Many who believe the brothers should be released. Many say they feel like they've served enough time for the crimes that they committed because of the new evidence that they want to present about the sexual abuse, which did not make it in during their second trial. Many people believe that this was a gross uh, a, a gross use of, of, of the court and that they that they had some sort of misjustice here. But one thing we did hear today was testimony from two of the Menendez brothers' aunts. They're both elderly, both dealing with some medical issues, so that's why the judge allowed them to give testimony. They both said that they believe the brothers were molested, they believe that they've served their time, and they want them home. They don't want to see them anymore inside the jail. And we just got an update or a statement from the incoming DA, Nathan Hockman. The judge, by the way, decided to push this date back to January 30th and 31st because he says he wants to, first of all, review the information himself, but also to give this new DA time to review as well. So Nathan Hockman sent a statement saying that Judge Jessick's decision to continue the hearing on the resentencing 
motion to January 30th to 31st will provide me with sufficient time to review the extensive prison records, transcripts of two lengthy trials and voluminous exhibits, as well as consult with prosecutors, law enforcement, defense counsel and victims and victim family members. Many wanted to see Eric and Lyle Menendez. We did hear them. Not sure which one, but they did confirm that they could see and hear us inside the courtroom. But again, we just heard that really short remark from them. Hallie. All right. So more to come in just a couple of months from now. Dana Griffin, thank you very much for being in there and for being on top of that. Appreciate it. Lots more to come here on the show, including Macy's now pushing off this really important report ahead of the holiday season because of a multi-million dollar expense report mess up. Yeah, what do you hear about it? Plus, how people in New England are rescuing dozens of whales stranded on a beach. The First Lady doing one White House tradition for the very last time today. That's coming up in just a couple of minutes. But first, you may not believe why Macy's is delaying a super important earnings report that was supposed to come out tomorrow. Turns out it's because one employee apparently did not do their expenses properly to the tune of, wait for it, $154 million. Yeah. So now this multinational corporation can't even put out this whole third quarter earnings report yet, which is a report that investors were supposed to be looking at to get clues into how much Macy's thinks shoppers will spend over the holidays. That's after this employee intentionally, according to Macy's, left out millions of dollars worth of deliveries over a period of years. Macy's is investigating, obviously. Sam Brock is joining us now with more. The company hasn't said whether they're going to charge this employee. This is a staggering amount of money we're talking about here. How does something like this even happen? Because it's not like the employee, Macy says, they didn't pocket it and run off with it. No, certainly, Hallie. You're talking about a big chunk of money. What's maybe more astounding than that is over three plus years, right? This started back in Q4 of 2021 and stretched all the way to Q3 of 2024. How did no one at the company notice that this was going on? We're Sam, talking about expenses for like delivery, right? Like an $8 right? sunscreen on your expense report. Sure, all right. of our bosses, which is fine. It's, the, it's their money. They can know about the $8. If, but like, it's if, just... It's a... <laughs> if we messed up our expense reports like this, I think we would have lost our jobs a long time ago. Be that as as it may. Here's kind of a shocking part about this, Hallie. If you look at the pre-market trading for Macy's, stock was down like 8%. By the end of the day, it was trading at $15.94 a share down, two and a quarter percent, which is to say investors looked at this truncated earnings report and were like, eh, nothing really to see here, which, which may sound a little bit surprising. We mentioned the sum, $152 million, $54 million, something like that. It is and it isn't a lot of money. It isn't in the sense that the overall uh, expenses in this area for Macy's were $4.46 billion, and you're talking about $152 million, so it's a fraction. But the, another way to look at this is their, their net income for all of 2023 was a little over $100 million. So this is 50% more than that, right? So depending on how you want to slice it, it is a lot of money. The company did have a statement here, Allie. I'll read you just a portion of that. While we work dil diligently to complete the investigation as soon as practicable, whatever that means, and ensure this matter is handled appropriately, our colleagues across the company are focused on serving our customers and executing our strategy for a successful holiday season. The bottom line here is that Macy says it didn't affect their cash flow, didn't affect their vendor payments. They're moving forward and expecting a full earnings report on December 11th. Okay, and that earnings report is going to be interesting because for a lot of these big companies, right, they're forecasting to a degree what they expect for the all-important holiday season, yeah. right? It's a very pivotal time of year. Um, there is no question. There's going to be a lot of eyeballs on them. In terms of the information that we have already received from Macy's, they did show that they're down about 2.4% year over year for Q3 when it turn, when it concerns the sales here. So that's not a great sign. Investors are planning on spending more money, but Macy's does feel very good about 50 or so locations where sales have actually gone up. So we're always seeing the silver lining here, Hallie. Sam Brock, thank you very much. You got it. Uh, appreciate that. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a judge in Tennessee ruling there will be separate trials for the former police officers accused of killing Tyree Nichols. Remember, Nichols was beaten during a traffic stop in 2023 and died three days later. Attorneys for three of the former officers argued their trials should be separated from a fourth who pleaded guilty. The other three pleaded not guilty to all charges. The trial is set to begin in April.
Number two, Hyundai is recalling more than 40,000 cars because they may roll away. Basically, the cars can shift out of park without the brake pedal being pressed. The recall covers some 2025 models. Hyundai says it hasn't gotten any reports of crashes so far. The dealer will fix it for free. Number three, Patrick Mahomes is being fined more than $14,000 for what the NFL calls a violent gesture during last week's game against the Bills. Mahomes, of course, the QB for the Chiefs, allegedly put up his hands as if he were holding a rifle. A rep for Mahomes did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Number four, more than 30 pilot whales are now safely back in the ocean after they stranded themselves on a beach in New Zealand. Look at this. People help and get them back into the water by lifting them up on sheets. Apparently, New Zealand is kind of a stranding hotspot, especially for this particular type of whale. Number five, First Lady Jill Biden welcoming the official White House Christmas tree earlier today. There she is, celebrating its arrival alongside the families of some military members. The tree is nearly 20 feet tall and comes from North Carolina. When we come back, some pretty scary scenes out of Lithuania. The investigation after a cargo plane crashed into a house. Plus, growing concern and anger tonight in Britain. Why people there say they did not get enough warning about a deadly storm. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's a look at what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Israel, that country, and Hezbollah are apparently getting closer to a ceasefire deal, according to three senior Biden administration officials. You're looking at the airstrikes. This is after weeks of heavy airstrikes from both sides. Israel's assaults on Lebanon have killed more than 3,000 people and displaced more than a million others, according to local officials. Now, the ceasefire would be limited to Lebanon, meaning there would be no relief to Palestinians in Gaza or to the dozens of hostages taken by Hamas. Out of Egypt, at least 17 people are missing after a tourist yacht sank in the Red Sea. 44 people were on board. Rescuers saved some two dozen of them so far. Some of them had to be airlifted for help. The local governor said it was rough seas behind the sinking. And out of Lithuania, officials say one person is dead and three others hurt after a DHL cargo plane crashed into the house. This is the aftermath you're looking at. It all happened less than a mile from where the plane was supposed to land at an airport. The victim was a Spanish crew member. Nobody on the ground was hurt, and the cause of the crash is still being investigated. In a case that has shocked France and the rest of the world, a French prosecutor today is asking for the maximum sentence for the man who organized the mass rape of his wife for about a decade. Remember, Dominique Pellicot admitted to drugging his wife, Giselle, repeatedly and inviting dozens of strangers to sexually assault her while she was unconscious. The prosecution telling the court the maximum sentence is 20 years, which is a lot. But at the same time, they say too little in view of the seriousness of the acts that were committed and repeated. You are hearing and seeing the crowds of supporters who have regularly shown up to support Giselle Pellico throughout this trial. She has become a symbol there of the fight against sexual violence. Pellico insisted that the trial be held in public. She wanted it to be held publicly, saying she hoped it would help other women speak up. Yasmin Vesugian is joining us now. And Yasmin, it is not just, it is 50 other men who are also yeah. on trial accused of rape. So walk us through the scope of this, uh, the sentencing and where this goes. Um, it's incredible to think what has taken place um, with this couple, um, this now ex-wife and ex-husband, um, and what has kind of emerged throughout this prolonged trial. And in fact, Dominique Pellicot has admitted to, to drugging his wife um, and to inviting strangers into their home who subsequently sexually assaulted and, and raped um, his then wife while she was unconscious. It is, it is horrendous to even think about the reality of that. And it's really kind of gripped the nation, gripped France throughout this entire time. I mean, the evidence how that was shown throughout this case was 20,000 or so videos um, that were saved on hard drives on Dominique Pellico's phone as well that were played in the courtroom in front of Giselle Pellico as they presented the case um, in this courtroom. And remember, these are incidences in which she has no memory of. She was unconscious and she was drugged um, this entire time. Just to kind of give you a sense of how this is really affecting the country as a whole, she was applauded 
as she arrived at the courthouse just the mm. other day. She is becoming a symbol for women everywhere, and specifically in France, going up against her ex-husband, Hal, along with these 50 or so men accused of sexually assaulting and, and raping her in her home. And the fact that this has become so, so high profile, Yaz, yeah. as you mentioned, the fact that she has become this kind of symbol, is that expected to have any impact on the sentencing here? Yes. I, I, the, I, 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 my assumption would be maybe not if it's just the letter of the law, but you tell me. So the prosecutor has essentially said we are asking for the maximum here, which is, which is 20 years. However, the prosecutor has gone on to say as well, that is not enough. And she said, mm -hmm. and I quote, he is considered incredibly dangerous, a husband and a grandfather responsible for the most horrendous acts. He is not mentally incompetent. He chose to do this. So in a way, it could impact the sentencing in that he receives the maximum and or yeah. beyond here. And then, of course, we're talking about those 50 or so men who could see anywhere from 10 to possibly 20 years in prison as well. And you see in some of these images here, Hal, of the renderings in the courtroom, many of those men decide to show up in masks um, because to hide their identities from uh, the courtroom cameras. Wow. Yasmin Vasugin, thank you for staying on top of this story. Uh, Thanks, one I know you've been following for a while. Appreciate it. Tonight, also overseas, you've got more rain drenching the UK as a deadly storm batters Britain with a ton of flooding, some landslides, and a whole lot of power outages. At least five people have been killed. And the cleanup, it has barely begun. You've got trees down all over the place in England, Wales, Ireland. Look at this. You see the water up to almost the brake lights, a little bit past that out of that van right there. Some people have been seen using buckets to try to get the water out of their houses. And there is a growing anger now. Some folks are furious with local officials, saying they were nowhere near prepared for something like this and didn't give them any warning. Matt Bradley is joining us now from London. If not any warning, Matt, at least not enough warning, right? That's where some of this fury stems from. That's the real issue, and the Met Office had said that they did offer warning 48 hours in advance, so they're kind of rebuffing a lot of these criticism. But, you know, Storm Bert has been causing a lot of damage, at least three deaths in England and Wales. Some of the winds were clocked at more than 80 miles an hour. Hundreds of homes have been flooded and roads were washed out. And the problem is, as you said, there were some forecasters who've been taking blame for this, for not predicting the size of the storm adequately. And in one of the hard-hit areas of Wales, that's a country in the western part of the UK, the Met Office, the Met Office, they're the ones who do the weather here, they said it was only a yellow-level storm rather than a red-level storm. So that's been causing a lot of anger. As I said, the Met Office pushing back. But, you know, it's a lot of the patterns that we've been seeing in the past where, you know, we've been seeing weather causing its own kind of storms in politics. And now the ruling party, the Labour Party, has they, they've wasted no time blaming the previous Conservative Party. They said that the flood defenses, and this is from the Environment Minister who said this just today, that they were in the worst condition on mm. record when the Labour Party took over after those elections in July. So this is becoming very much like we've seen so many times in the States and in Spain a couple of weeks ago. It's becoming a political issue. That's right. Hallie. Setting aside even the politics, Matt, just looking at some of the pretty incredible images we're seeing of people trying to get through the water here. This cleanup is massive. We're not talking days. It's going to be weeks or months. Fair? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, Hallie, a lot of these storms that we see here in the UK, the weather is just generally so much milder. We're talking about 82 mile per hour winds. That was the highest what we saw with uh, Hurricane Helen uh, back a couple of months ago. That was almost twice as much, but still a ton of damage because there isn't a lot of preparation for some really, really harsh weather. But even today, we've been hearing that there is going to be more rain. The Met Office had said that Bert is going to start to pull away from the British Isles today. But even at the start today, and it's pretty late here now, there were 125 flood warnings and one severe flood warning across the country. So there could be even more rain and even more okay. destruction. Matt Bradley, thank you very much for that. Live for us overseas. Appreciate it. Coming up back here at home, an inside look behind the scenes at preps for holiday season travel, including what happens to those planes overnight. Our Tom Costello pulls back the curtain as one of the country's biggest airlines gets ready for what's ahead. The holiday shopping season officially kicking off this week, and it looks like a lot of folks are going to be turning online for help. Turning to TikTok, which, hey, is it the new QVC? 
Some people think maybe it is. A survey from Sprout Social found something like nearly 90% of customers saying social media platforms like TikTok and Insta will influence their gifting decisions. And about a quarter of Americans say they actually do plan to make purchases on those apps, and that's where the apps can make some money. Julia Borston is joining us now. I would be lying to you if I told you my phone was not filled with screen grabs from the various platforms of things that I've seen people selling. I am easily influenced in the shopping realm, I'll admit it. Um, and that, that could be a big game changer this holiday season, right? That's right. TikTok says it expects to see a record amount of sales on the platform this holiday season. And it's not just people who see an ad and then click to buy something from the ad or a brand that they follow clicking to take advantage of a Black Friday sale. What we are seeing is a surge of live shopping influencers who are demoing products or unwrapping things or showcasing and trying things on. And what they're doing is they're doing this live and TikTok has enabled them to have links where you can click and buy. And while they're doing a live shop, Shopping demo and never leave TikTok. So this is a win for TikTok. Oh, wait, Julia. Because it means you're shopping Julia. within the app and you're never leaving. That are that existed on regular TV and it was literally called like the Home Shopping Network or QVC, right? That's like right. that is that's a thing that happened that like Gen Z is kind of rediscovering and doing it their own way. What's old is new again. People like to see live. It's exciting. That's what we're doing right now. This is live. And I think the key thing about live shopping is it feels more authentic. People like influencers because they're impressed by them. They can relate to them. Maybe they trust them more than a 30 second spot on TV. And there's something about the authenticity of a live demonstration that makes people feel connected and excited to make a purchase. Is it to the scale yet where it's going to have any impact on the more traditional stores and online shopping, like not on social media? Well, we'll see. This is going to be an interesting thing to watch this holiday season. Younger, younger people, younger shoppers, they're the ones who are more likely, Gen Z, they're the ones who are more likely to make purchases on these social platforms. Maybe other people of that 89% see something on social media and then they go and find it at the mall. So there's a huge influence from these influencers, even if they're not closing the sale on these platforms. Um, but we'll see if it ends up having an impact. We've definitely seen some smaller brands really benefit from that attention from influencers. So interesting. Julia Borston, thank you very much. Thanks for being on. Good to see you. So airlines are working overtime right now, getting ready for what's expected to be the busiest Thanksgiving travel season on record. And our Tom Costello is getting a behind the scenes look at how one of the country's busiest airlines is gearing up for the rush with workers looking to keep you safe and comfortable. 7.45 p.m., American tail number N954AN pulls into JFK from Chicago. As the last passengers step off, the pilots are handing over control. Anything that we might have noticed that wasn't perfect on the way over, we report it. Minutes later, the 737 is empty and on the move, taxiing across the runways and pulling into American's 24-7 maintenance hangar where the overnight pit crew already has their orders. We'll be servicing the oil, the engine oil system. We'll be looking at the igniter plugs. They've got a long to-do list. American 737s get a workout. 10 flights each every day, carrying 1,800 passengers a day. Every 90 days, 737s must go through an overnight A-check. And routine maintenance, even at the gate, happens every night. We got a lot of work to do, and we fly at dawn. Evie Garces is in charge of all line maintenance. Is this like an indie pit crew for American Airlines? Definitely. I can tell you that our mechanics here are dedicated to do this work. They have about eight hours of touch time to complete the work. A nose to tail physical. From inspecting the flight controls to the flight deck to the passenger experience. Check the, uh, the call lights, check the reading lights. Make sure the uh, gas prevents are all good. They're not broken. There's the cracked window shade, a broken tray table, an entertainment power unit that needs replacing, a seat track that needs tightening, and the lavatory water that needs sanitizing. What's the most common complaint you hear from passengers about they want this fixed? They wish this didn't break. Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. In today's world, Wi-Fi. Fixing the Wi-Fi is a top priority. So is checking all 328 USB and electrical plugs. Yeah, we like to have the, the best appearance possible. The clock is ticking. Hi there. Welcome. With 8 million passengers flying on American Airlines alone this Thanksgiving, the maintenance teams have been working ahead. We're prepaying maintenance, doing tasks to make sure that 
we minimize the risk during the holiday period. At 4 a.m. after a deep clean, they're done. And 954-AN pushes out of the hangar and back to the terminal for catering. Flight 2485 to Miami. At 7.20 a.m., flight 2485 is boarding for Miami. Right, we've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.